Shabbat Shalom to you. Hope you're doing well today. As we start uh, the, the message today, we're going to be in the portion called Shmini. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Shmini. So when we say Shmini Atzeret, we're talking about the eighth day, the great eighth day at the end of Sukkot, right? So the word means eighth. So as we talk about that today, remember in the previous portion, Tzav, uh, which is uh, about commanding, Aaron and his sons have been consecrated. And so we talked about that they're going to be inaugurated and they're going to have their first offering here. So uh, back in chapter 8, I just want to refresh your mind. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read it. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged so that you do not die. So you have a command, for he's commanded this. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded so that's why the portion's called eighth, because they were there for seven days, and now on the eighth day, and that's where we began today. So if you kind of see an overview of all of Leviticus here, and we look here where we are, we're very close to the beginning of this whole thing, where Aaron makes his first sacrifice as high priest. That's what he's doing here, and we're going to talk about that. And of course, in this portion, too, we have uh, the strange fire that's offered by Nadav and Avihu. And you're like, who are those guys? So let me tell you what it sounds like in Texan or Alabama. Okay, Nadab and Abihu is Nadav and Avihu. All right? So you can impress your friends when you go visit them at church and say, well, actually, their names are Nadav and Avihu. And they're going to be like, what? What are you talking about? So Leviticus chapter 9, we're going to start there. And this is where it says, now it happened on the eighth day. The eighth day, Moses called Aharon his sons and elders of Israel. Then he said to Aaron, take a calf from the herd of a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before Adonai. You are to speak to Mene Israel, saying, take a male goat for a sin offering, along with a calf and a lamb, both yearlings without blemish, for a burnt offering, plus a bull and a ram for fellowship offerings to sacrifice before Adonai. Listen, he's going to be busy. Along with a grain offering mixed with oil, for today Adonai appears to you. So they brought what Moses commanded before the tent of meeting. Remember, the tent of meeting is the Mishkan. It's the tabernacle. It's the same thing. And the entire congregation drew near and stood before Adonai. Moses said, this is what Adonai commanded that you shall do, so that the glory of Adonai may appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and bring your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself I'm going to point that out. And for the people. Then present the offering for the people. And make atonement for them as Adonai commanded. So Aaron did. He drew near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. So Moses explained that the kavod Adonai, the glory of the Lord, is going to fall uh, after this offering. And it's very, very interesting here. Why? was that bull offering made by Aaron for himself first? Well, we have to go all the way back to Exodus and the golden calf incident. This is an atonement for that incident. Now, that's amazing. If you go back and look at it and you see what's happening here, it reminds me of the story of Yeshua and Peter, right? So, so you know, Yeshua's arrested, and then all the mishigas and craziness happens, and Peter's out there warming himself and says, hey, you, you're, you're one of his disciples. And he's like, nope, don't know the guy. Uh, yeah, you were with him. Nope, don't know him. And then finally the third time he says, I denied who, who Yeshua is. And we hear the rooster crow, right? And so then Yeshua comes later and he says, Simon, son of John, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. This is one of those times where God says, hey, Aaron, buddy, you're in charge now. We need to settle this right now. Remember that incident way back then? You're going to consecrate yourself, and you're going to lead the way. You're going to be the leadership model for everyone else, and you're going to sacrifice this animal for what happened when, earlier when you said, I don't know how it just jumped out of the fire. I don't know what happened. This golden calf just came out of nowhere. So he's doing this at this point. This sin offering was made with the whole burnt offering of a lamb. It's perhaps even a recollection to what Isaac did and the Akedah, and the foreshadowing of something that Yeshua is going to do for us, the greater Lamb of God. So we see this here. 
The very first sacrifice of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was a sin offering for Aaron and his intended atonement for what happened with the idolatrous relationship with the golden calf. Amazing how full circle comes, right, in our lives. So let's jump ahead to verse 22. Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. Then he stepped down from presenting the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offerings. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came back out and blessed the people, the glory of Adonai appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of Adonai and devoured the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Yeah, I bet they did. Can you imagine what that was like? So Moses and Aaron, go, they go into the Mishkan. They go into the tabernacle. And for all of us who've been up here and maybe you're, you know, you're going to sing a song or you do something and you expect some cue to happen and it doesn't happen and you're standing there awkwardly, you can imagine how this was for these guys. They've laid hands. They've, they've done the, the sacrifice. And we know that Moses said, the glory of God's going to fall. And they're like, hey, Mo, it's not here yet. Wait for it. Wait for it. They go in, they come back out, and then the glory falls. And you can imagine what that was like. Just the remainder of this portion is about the, uh, the strange fire offered by Nadav and Avihu. We see that in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, we begin a section of holiness laws. Uh, of course, the famous kashrut or kosher chapter of uh, Leviticus 11. Been a famous chapter uh, called by many the kosher laws. Uh, but I would say that these are laws of eating of clean and unclean, okay? And the reason why I say that is that the word kosher is not even there. It's, it doesn't even appear. It's tameh and tahor, those two words, unclean and clean. So the word kosher actually comes from kashar, another, a kesher rather, uh, sorry, kashar. So it's another word that's found in Hebrew that actually has to do with being fit or being right. And so... When you, you say somebody, hey, you're not kosher, what you're saying is you're not fit or you're not right. Okay, it's different than really the meaning of clean and unclean. Where do we find that the first time in the Tanakh? We find it in the book of Esther, of all places. The first time this word, uh, kosher, is mentioned. So she said, if it pleases the king and if uh, I have found favor before him and it seems right or it seems fit to the king. That's the first time we see that phrase and that word there. So when we, we really want to talk about this, I want you to make sure that you understand when we talk about the kosher laws, what we're talking about is clean and unclean, okay? Why is that important? Because God wanted to set Israel apart and make them distinct. It's more than having a pork chop sandwich. It's more than having fried catfish. It's, it's more than that, okay? It's, it's about setting apart a people, so these unclean animals, listen, a, a, a lot of us in here have done the research. We, we understand that bottom-feeding animals are probably not the most healthy thing for us to eat, right? But all of us who've had them before, when they're fried up, let's, 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 let's go ahead and confess our sins. They're pretty darn good, right? When you had those way back before you, you know, didn't eat those anymore, everybody's like, what are you talking about? I never have done that. Uh-huh. Sure you haven't. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a touchy subject for a lot of people. But when you get into this, I want you to understand that this is the important thing. Do you not think that God was concerned about the nations being healthy too? He was. Think God wanted them to eat healthy as well? Sure. But what you need to understand is it's my, a lot more than shrimp etouffee here. It's more than that. It's about being set apart. And being a distinct nation before the Lord. Wearing your cotton polyester blend was a no-no. So be, why? Because God wanted you to be set apart. We didn't mix two kinds of seed in the field. Why? Because we were weird farmers? No, because God said be set apart. And I, I want you to walk away from this uh, passage to be very careful to our church friends and not bash them over their catfish fry. But instead, encourage them that what we are doing is being set apart. Not because we get righteousness out of it. Not because we get salvation out of it. It's because 
God has called a people to be a covenant people, the Jewish people, and he has set them apart. And so we see this in Cornelius. It's kind of cool, actually. Let me just read this first from Leviticus to just kind of wrap up the whole thought here. For I am Adonai, your God, therefore sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. You are not to defile yourselves with any kind of creeping thing that moves on the earth. For I am Adonai who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, I want you to walk away today and say, well, Rabbi says we should eat a catfish sandwich. No, I didn't say that. What I'm saying is, is that God wants us to be set apart as, as, a, as a covenant people. And he gave that command to Israel. And so our Jewish friends in the room, you guys are a covenant people for God. And that covenant fidelity, you want to continue to do that? Baruch Hashem. For all of you Gentiles in the room who want to continue in that faithfulness, Baruch Hashem. But what we've got to make sure is we don't bash those over the head and say, you must do it this way if you're in the church, okay? Uh, because what we see, and I always love to share this part of it, when we get to Acts chapter 10, and Peter has three visions, and God says, don't call what I've called clean, common. And he's not talking about what Peter's going to eat. He's talking about whose, whose house Peter's going to go to. And so as Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and he goes into that house, you have to understand, folks, if you don't know the, the, the culture and the context here, Old Pete ain't supposed to go into that house and visit his friend Cornelius. It is an abomination for him to go into an unclean Roman person's house, even if they're a God-fearer. So Pete goes in. He starts preaching the gospel. I've shared this before, but he gets to point three. He's got a great sermon. He's winding it up. But before he gets to point three, the real Chakodesh, the Holy Spirit, falls on dirty, rotten Romans and Greeks. Those catfish eaters. The Spirit of God falls on the shrimp etouffee people. And it's the same Spirit that filled Peter. See, that's what makes you kosher. What makes you kosher is the Spirit of God. That's what sets you apart. Now look, I think it's a good idea to eat clean. It's real good for your health. A lot of us know that. And we as a congregation are covenantally faithful to that. And we will never, never serve pork and beans at, a, at any service, anything we do. We're not going to do that. In fact, we try to be careful even with m milk and meat. We do. But the important thing here, folks, and I want you to walk away with this, is it's about covenant fidelity and the regeneration that we experience in the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're going to continue our series in Mark here. And today we're in part four. So if you figured out that we're on uh, message four and we're only 20 verses in, it's going to take me about three years to get through this, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I promise I'll try to, we'll try to speed up here and there. But today is such an amazing passage. It's one of my favorites so far that I've come across in Mark uh, but I want to review just real quickly, if I can, just go back and just kind of touch on uh, verses 14 through 20 for those of you who are trying to uh, just kind of catch up to where we are. We talked about the importance of uh, the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God involves proclaiming the right message. The message of the good news is for us to repent and to believe in Yeshua, the gospel, to, to believe in the good news. We also said that we want to find the right people in the process of that. Building the kingdom means finding those right people, and a great movement must have good people. And folks, it, it might even be laughable to us that the movement starts with four Galilean fishermen. But that's, that's God's economy, not mine. And so we are building uh, the disciples here. Yeshua is building them, and we start with these four fishermen who become fishers of men. And then following the right master is the last thing. And I, I want to bring up a point that I, I did not finish with last week that's extremely important. Why we follow the right master? Why do we do this? Folks, what we see here in these pages and what we see when Yeshua says to these fishermen and the others, tax collectors, other folks, he says, come follow me. Now to us, that might not seem like a big deal. But folks, let me explain to you what a big deal that was. You see, for rabbis, rabbis would, would have disciples come to them, and they would say, uh, I'm going to follow your teaching and your way you teach Torah. 
And maybe a prophet of God would say, come follow the message of God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, whoever it might be. But Yeshua doesn't say that. He says, come follow me. So you're saying, follow God, and you're saying, follow me. That makes Yeshua, yes, it makes him deity. It makes him Lord. And folks, that is the astounding message here. Different than any rabbi, different than any other prophet. He is a prophet like none other that comes after Moses. And so we see this, and it puts him on a level of authority of the Holy One of God. And we'll we'll see him be called that today, Holy One of God, but not by who you would think. It's a, it's a different deal. So Yeshua called them. They left everything. And folks, we must do the same. So as we pick up today, we're going to start in verse 21, Mark 21. I put that background there on purpose. Uh, they went into Capernaum right away on Shabbat. He entered the synagogue and began to teach. So this is the move from the seashore to the synagogue. The seashore to the synagogue. And I didn't point it out earlier, but that's the name of our message today. From the shores to the synagogue, a day in the life of Yeshua. Okay, if we were blogging this and there was a video camera going around, uh, we would kind of see a day in the life of Yeshua here. So we see this. He goes into the synagogue at Capernaum. By the way, back in the background, that is the synagogue at Capernaum. If you go to Israel, you will see that synagogue in a place called Kafar Nahum. And everybody says, God bless you. No. Kafar Nahum is the village of comfort or the village of Nahum, the prophet. Now, Nahum doesn't have any relation to this particular synagogue or this region, but his name means comfort. Nahamu Ami, comfort my people. And so when we see this synagogue here, we see Kafar Nahum, we see the village of comfort. Is it, it's not lost on us that Yeshua, the great comforter, is centering his operation in the village of comfort. Isn't that something? The village of comfort is where he is. And so it's astounding that his home base is here. And uh, guys, if you can turn this up on the, on the soundboard for the computer, we might be able to pick the volume up here on this, but I'm going to show a little video from my wife as she snapped a, a couple of pics and then took a video last year here in Israel. I love my wife's commentary. Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yes, it is pretty cool. It's an amazing place to be. But you get the location. It would be like, I'm not suggesting this. It would be like if we all built our houses in the property next door and then just walked right over to Shul every week. Yeah, don't do that. It's, uh, it's going to be purpose for something else. But yeah, yeah. And maybe over by the new uh, Starbucks on the other side. We can go over there. Yeah. Uh, But you see how close the fisherman village is, not only to the water, but to the synagogue, the lifeblood, the spiritual lifeblood of where they were. Literally just outside their door, they've got to walk a few paces away to this place. So we see here, uh, as he's teaching in this synagogue, you've seen the picture of it. It says they, those who were in the hearing of, of Yeshua that day, they were astounded at his teaching. For he was teaching as one having authority and not as the Torah scholars. That's just a slight slam if you can't pick up on that. So number one today, we're talking about his authority to teach. A life in the day of Yeshua means he has authority to teach. He's an amazing teacher. And so as we see another picture of this same place, he teaches at this synagogue and his authority leaves people awestruck. Because it's such a stark contrast to the scribes. You see, the scribes are amazing and very good at the interpretation of the law. 
But as they uh, are teaching, they're going to be doing it in a very different kind of a rapid-fire way. Well, Rabbi Hillel says this. Oh, but Rabbi Gamaliel says this. Oh, but Rabbi Eliezer says this. And Yeshua comes in and says, but I say this. What do you mean? You're not quoting another rabbi? No, I am the rabbi. Amen. The rabbi. The only one you're ever going to need. And so instead of saying Rabbi Hillel, he says, truly, truly, amen, amen. In the King James, verily, verily, I say to you. You see, Yeshua did not quote the authorities. He spoke as the authority. And he is the authority. And so in case it was lost on them, though, there was somebody there in the room who recognized that authority pretty quickly. And so we'll see that Yeshua ben Elohim here, even in this religious space, sees an unclean spirit. So his authority to cast out the demonic is the second thing we see in the day of the life. First, his authority to teach. Secondly, his authority to cast out the demonic. Now, this is really, really amazing here. So as we read Mark 20, 1, 23 through 24 here, just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And just digest that for just a moment. Okay, you're in a spiritual space. You're in a place here where this guy hasn't seemed to need to cry out before. And all of a sudden, Ben Elohim, the son of the living God, he comes into the room, and something lights up this guy, and it's the unclean spirit in him, better known as the demonic or a demon. And so this particular person begins to respond to the holiness, the holy one of God in this room. Listen, the enemy can't stand worship. Years ago, my wife and I, this was over 30 years ago, I can't believe it, we were at a congregation, and we were serving, and we were doing some worship, and I saw my wife just kind of duck out real quick of the service. I'm like, where'd she go? I found out later there was a young lady who, as soon as the worship started, she had to leave. And this pattern repeated, and then our pastor's wife and my wife went to help her. And this lady was suicidal. She was demonized. She had, I had never seen anything like this in my life. So the, the pastor and his wife asked us to come get involved in the situation. And after many, many, many counseling sessions, we saw demonic spirits leave this lady it was uh, in fact it was on memorial day that year and she she received something from the lord and the lord said you're going to get free on memorial day it'll be memorial for you so we got there that day we noticed and folks this is a true story you can ask my wife i i hadn't even been at beth messiah yet but i learned something that day that the demonic doesn't like the name yeshua and when i say yeshua i mean yeshua We've been saying Jesus for a long time, and all of a sudden we switched gears and said Yeshua, and boy, that got a reaction. And folks, I, I'm, you can't make this stuff up. Listen, it, it was, I don't want to give the enemy any more glory, so I'm just going to tell you, this woman was delivered, and she was healed that day from bondage, and it was an amazing thing. So you can imagine, this was a bit of a shock to the normal Shabbat service, Right? And so the possession is a satanic counterfeit to the possession of the Holy Spirit. He, the enemy's always trying to counterfeit what God's doing. And so somewhat of a new thing here, we see the demonic influence. You know, we don't see a whole lot of this in the Tanakh, right? We, we see a little bit of it. We see the demonization of Saul. We see David come and play his harp. And what happens when worship happens? The enemy flees. So we see this happen. And so in the same situation here, we move on. It says... The, the Spirit says, what have we to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? Yeshua of Nazareth. Notice it says we there. There's a possibility that it could be more than one, but we find out later he cast out the Spirit. There was one Spirit. So what is this we all about? This is so exciting because this represents the fact that back in the battle when Yeshua was fasting for 40 days, there was a message that was sent out after Yeshua was victorious to the whole entire enemy camp. The Holy One of God is here. Run. Hallelujah. Run. We're in trouble. 
And so he says here, have you come to destroy us? Because that's the story on the street in the, in the pub down the road where all the demons hang out. That's the story. So they've got together and they realize, so it's have, what have we to do with you? Meaning, what does this entire demonic realm have to do with you? He's speaking for all of them when he says this. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. He doesn't blaspheme Yeshua there. He acknowledges who he is because he can't do anything else in the presence of Ben Elohim. He can't do it. Whew, that's powerful. That'll, that'll preach right there. The demon recognized Yeshua. We realize this, but we, I want you to see something here. This is amazing. Notice that he says Yeshua of Nazareth and the Holy One of God. He recognizes not only his humanity and that he's from Nazareth, but his divinity that he's from heaven. He knows he is the God man. He is the Holy One of Israel who's been sent, the one that Isaiah prophesied about. This one has come to destroy. He's invaded the kingdom of darkness, and these guys know it, and they're running for the hills. So Yeshua rebuked him, saying, quiet, come out of him. I love our English translation there. <laughs> in, in, he, in Greek, it's more like, zip it, buddy. <laughs> Technically, it's the word for muzzling. Muzzle it. When you say... Uh, you shall not muzzle an ox when it tramples out the grain. When Paul says that, the same exact Greek word is used there, muzzling. He's saying muzzle it, be quiet. In fact, this is also the same word that's used uh, in Mark chapter 4, in the quieting of the sea, be still. Hey, sea, wind, muzzle it. Yeshua has power over the demonic, and he has power over the prince of the power of the air and everything that's going on in the storms. He is the authority. He is the one who is God over the sea and over the waves and over anything else that the enemy can throw at him. They were so amazed at this teaching and his authority. They were amazed, but not to the point of repenting and believing. Hadn't quite got there yet. Haven't quite got to the point. Hey, that's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Haven't seen that before. Truth is, they probably haven't seen that before. You see, in this time, in in. There were actually Jewish exorcists, folks. There actually were Jewish exorcists. That's not the phrase they would use, but they would, they would try to pray for those who had demons and spirits. But until Yeshua comes on the scene, if you read in antiquity, you don't see a whole lot of accounts of these things. You see some, but most of the time they end in failure. Most of the time they end in failure until this rabbi comes on the scene. And when this rabbi comes on the scene... He's got a, he's batting a thousand when it comes to casting out the enemy. And so a lot of these, if you go back and read some of these accounts of these uh, sages and rabbis trying to cast out, it's a great, it's a great formula, but none of them have success really. So when it says here that these people were astounded, I mean, let's, let's continue to read it. The unclean spirit, after throwing the man into convulsions, came crying out with a loud voice and came out of him. So once again, the unclean spirit won. So when we say we earlier, he's kind of speaking as a spokesperson for all of the, uh, the demonic. They were all amazed. They asked themselves, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This is a whole new level here, folks. We haven't seen this before. What's going on with the guest speaker today at the synagogue in Kafar Nahum? Where'd this guy come from? Is this not Joseph's son? You can hear him. You know, they're murmuring, right? And immediately news about him spread throughout the region surrounding Galilee. Have you ever taken a pebble before and just kind of dropped it in the water? And you see the concentric circles that go out from it? This is what happened right now. Yeshua's preaching in Capernaum, in Capernaum was a drop of a pebble in the water. And as he did... The waves went out, and, and, and they got on Snapchat, they got on Facebook, TikTok, and they made videos, and everybody came. Not really. But they, whatever their version of social media was back then, uh, they got the word out. And so they get the word out, and we find out that immediately about him, this word is spreading throughout the region of Galilee. 
So then verse 28 here, we see immediately, I want to point out to you, this word is used often by Mark, and immediately, and suddenly, and quickly. He uses this often in his language as they move from place to place very rapidly. Number three today, his authority to heal. So his authority to be the message deliverer of the good news, the one who can destroy the demonic, and number three, he's the one who has authority to heal. So once again, we go back to our picture here. This is kind of the end of what Becky showed you. The, these are the fishermen's houses, right? It says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with Jacob and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Now, let me just show you this, and no offense to our Catholic brothers and sisters, but that spaceship in the background there, that's a Catholic church. And they, they, why is there a Catholic church right in the middle of the fisherman village? Because they have venerated the house sitting just below the church. In fact, if you go into that building, there's a big glass uh, area where you can look right down and you can see Shimon Kepha, Peter's house, and Andrew's house. There it is. They have venerated the first pope. And that's what they would say. And so they, they, they venerated it. When you go in there, you can't say anything. You can't speak. You can't, you can't sing. You have to be quiet when you go into this building. Our group wasn't very good at that. <laughs> They were like, Hashem, praise God. I mean, finally, in fact, one, our, our tour guide had to say something like, zip it, muzzle it <laughs> to our folks because they were, it's probably my wife leading the crew, probably. I know she was good. She was good. So anyway, we go in there. We see this. This is where they were. Look how close that is to the synagogues. They're just right there, right? So Simon's mother-in-law was laying sick with a fever. Right away, they told Yeshua about her. Now, folks, for us, that might not seem like a big deal, right? You lay with a fever. You gotta, in our house, you got to have at least uh, 100 to get sympathy. So if it's 99.8, sorry, buddy, that's not really a fever. It's, you're kind of not feeling good. Maybe you're teething. I don't know. But <laughs> if you get to 100, my wife's like, poor baby. And I'm like, so what, we, what, do you, what do our kids do? Our kids go over to the light and just, you know, heat up the thermometer, put it back in. 116. Wow, you're sick. Yeah, that's what they do. Get some sympathy from mom. But in this case, they can't just pop some ibuprofen, right, or some Tylenol um, or whatever it is that you take to be able to reduce a fever. Fever can be bad, and, and fever can mean infection, and fever can lead to death. This is a big deal. So he came and raised her up by taking her hand. The fever left her, and as all good mothers-in-law do, she began to take care of them. Right? Every mom in the room knows what I'm talking about. Right? Every mom in the room knows that you're not allowed to get sick. And if you are sick, unless you're on your deathbed, you've got to take care of everybody else in the house who's sick. Because they're always worse than you. Right? That's how it goes. But in this case, it's an amazing thing. The rabbis regarded fever as a heavenly fire that only God could put out. If, if, if fever came on, and many times in, in, in the Tanakh, we see it as a judgment from God. And so only God can remove this heavenly fire. But God and his son comes into this house and removes this fever, right, from Peter's mother-in-law. What an amazing thing. Once again, remember the pebble we dropped earlier? Yeshua comes and drops another petal, pebble in the water, and more concentric circles go out. They get on Facebook. They get on Snapchat. They get on Instagram. They do all things. The whole town gathers. We see it coming. When evening came at sunset, the people brought to him all the sick who were afflicted by demons, and those who were afflicted by demons. All of them. Guess what? All means what? All. Yes. So everyone, imagine you live in Friendswood. All right, anybody living in Friendswood? All right, and let's say that Yeshua made an appearance in Friendswood, and all of a sudden the demonic was cast out, and uh, your mother-in-law lived in Friendswood, and she got healed. And next thing you know, there are 40,588 people, at least from the last census. That's how many people lived in Friendswood. So 40,588 people show up at your door. Did, did you see the picture of the house earlier and how small it was? Can you imagine what it had been like for the entire fishing village here, everyone in the surrounding region, to show up at this one place for all the need that's there, all the demand of casting out the enemy, all the need for healing those who are sick? 
So the whole town gathered together at the door. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not allow the demons to speak. Muzzle it. Shh. Because they knew who he was. Now listen, we, we a lot of us kind of think about that and think, what's the big deal? Listen, you don't want the devil to be your spokesperson. You just don't. Okay? He's not going to have the best social media campaign for you. So Yeshua is going to muzzle him and quiet him, but the word is getting out. The word has gotten out. So this scene also raises another question for us as we kind of wrap up today. This theological question of in, in Yeshua, in his salvation, is there healing? Well, let's read what Isaiah says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our shalom was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I want you to be clear here, folks. Rabbinic Judaism will tell you that's about Israel. But Israel's more than just one person. This is the suffering servant who's to come, according to Isaiah. And that suffering servant is Yeshua, the Messiah. And he's the one who brings healing. So the answer to that question of, is there healing in the atonement? It is, it's a resounding yes and a resounding amen. And listen, some of us who've experienced some pain on the earth and have not seen a physical healing, we question this. But let me finish the thought. There is healing in the atonement. For some, it is immediate, but it is temporary. Think about Lazarus, right? I mean, the guy's gone. He, he's completely gone. In fact, you know, the whole deal is in, in Judaism, the Yeshua, Lazarus, come forth. All right? And he comes out of that grave and we see a miracle there, but Yeshua, he, but it was still, guess what? This is rough, man. Lazarus had to die again. Oh, man. Twice. So a lot of us receive a healing from cancer. I think about Libya in the back getting completely healed of cancer. Others in this room have uh, Daniel and, and, the, and your, your family member who just recently got healed from kidney disease. We see healing happen. God has compassion and he touches those. Why not all? I do not have a good answer for you other than the fact that all of us will receive an ultimate healing if we're in Yeshua. All who trust in Yeshua as Messiah and Lord have an eternal and a permanent healing that cannot be taken away. How do I know? This is what's said by John in Revelation. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Shall be no, and death shall be no more. Nor shall there be mourning or crying or pain any longer. For the former things have passed away. And the one seated upon the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Then he said, Write, for these words are trustworthy and true. Yeshua, if you, if you, I think I've mentioned it before, but if you could take one of many themes in Mark, one of them is from Mark 10, 45, that Yeshua came to give his life a ransom for many. And today we see an example of this suffering servant who came, who has the authority to teach, the authority to des destroy the demonic realm, and the authority to heal every disease. In fact, next week, and I'm excited about it, next week he's going to heal someone who has uh, leprosy um, or some type of skin disease. And so we see him have the authority over all these. God has remedied our hopeless condition by sending Yeshua. You not know, think that there's hopelessness in this world? If we had the same thing happen today, can you imagine the number of people that would be at someone's door needing a healing, needing a deliverance? There's a lot of need out there. And folks, there's only one who can answer that for you. And his name is Yeshua. He's the son of the living God. He's the right arm of salvation. He is salvation, and his name in Hebrew means salvation. And he is the one who's been sent. And like Peter's mother-in-law, we should be quick to serve him after he does heal us ultimately in salvation. And serve others out of a grateful appreciation for such a wonderful Messiah. And the gift of salvation. See, in this passage, it was a normal day in the life of Yeshua. 
It was anything but normal for those who encountered and experienced his saving power that day. Amen. Would you pray with me? Avinu Makenu, our Father, our King, we thank you for the, the life that we receive in Yeshua. Lord, deliverance and healing and salvation. God, we thank you for it. And Lord, as we cling to you in this very hour, we thank you. Father, we pray for those in this room. We pray for those who are online who may need that very touch from you today. Maybe they need to be delivered from something. Maybe they had abuse as a child or in a relationship. Father, we pray for deliverance and healing for them. Maybe there is a sickness that they need to be released from. Lord, would you release them from that sickness today? Would you heal them? And in this room as well, as we pray every week at the Misha Barrett prayer, we trust that you are the one who heals. God, both body and soul. Lord, ultimately, I pray that you would heal those souls today who are sick with sin. Lord, that they would turn to you as their salvation, because you are the author of salvation, and you are the one who completes the good work in us. So, Father, we pray for that today in the mighty name of Yeshua. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.